This is the most unusual Christmas message I've ever given. And so if you want the nice, inspiring one, you'll have to come back tonight at 5 or 7 o'clock. <laughs> I don't mean to scare you, but we're going to venture into a part of the Christmas story that almost no one ever talks about. It's dark, it's dangerous, and quite honestly, it's embarrassing. And it raises more questions than we have answers to. And so we focus a lot on shepherds and wise men. And we focus a lot on a journey to Bethlehem. But there is a way that Joseph and Mary left. And it's terrifying. And the reason I talk about it is, first of all, it's in Scripture and it should not be ignored. The second reason I talk about it is because I think that there are people in our world today who are exactly in situations like this, and they think there's nothing in Scripture that speaks to them. And so what I'm hoping today is, is that we can lend our voice to the voices being proclaimed around the world to say that Christmas is for everyone, not just for the folks that are having a reasonably successful time. So we are in Matthew, the second chapter, and it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, Jesus came into our world to rescue our world because our world needs rescuing. This wasn't a sightseeing tour. It wasn't a reunion tour. This was a rescue mission. There are dark and destructive things that are done by people of every status in every tribe in our world. And they are done to people of every status and every tribe in our world. And yes, there are those who are targeted often because they are powerless. Fear drives a lot of decisions in our world. And those who perpetuate such actions, they use fear. And those who experience this, the consequences of those actions are exposed to fear. That's why it's so essential that we remember only the Prince of Peace is capable of driving out all of our fears. So Herod, he is a king, and you think that would be enough, but he's an insecure king, and he did not believe in the prophecies of Scripture, but he was worried that other people would, and that was not acceptable to him. Herod had actually himself used the Scriptures to target his murderous intent. The, men who, uh, the man who promises to go and worship when he finds the Christ child is the one who sends a death squad to take his life and all the boys in Bethlehem who are two years old and younger. So this is what I want to focus on this morning. God sent an angel to invade the dream of Joseph and to give this warning. Get up and get out. Get up and get out. You cannot stay in this town. You can't even stay in this country. The threat of Herod can only be avoided if you flee from this place to Egypt. And Joseph did not wait until morning. Let me just ask, how many of you would be willing to relocate your entire family in the middle of the night based on a dream? Not a single taker. <laughs> and Joseph did. He woke up married, they packed up what few belongings they had, and they went to Egypt. This raises some questions for me. 
Like, there are some things that I, I would like to know the answer to. Why couldn't God just destroy any soldier who came to threaten the life of Jesus? I mean, we have examples in Scripture of angels that single-handedly were able to destroy thousands of people in military combat. There's lots of stories like that. But why not now? Why does the earliest days of Jesus' life have to be marked by fear and fleeing? Why does he have to leave an occupied territory to become a refugee in another country? The, the question that follows up when I think about this is, what is likely to happen if an angel did kill those soldiers? Do you think Herod is going to say, well, that was unfortunate. I should let this go. I do not think so. Insecure people don't let things go. They escalate. Herod could not have his authority questioned in any realm of his country, and so the situation could have been that he would give an order for even more soldiers to take out an entire town. The loss of life would be unbelievable. And then I thought about this. What would the parenting lessons for Joseph and Mary be? How many parents do we have in the room? How many have found parenting to be hard? How many have found parenting to be impossible? It's, just, it's really, really hard. Parenting lessons. So what do you think they would have learned? What lesson could they have gleaned if they didn't have to follow sound and wise advice? All they had to do is just stay where they were, and angels would show up and take care of this baby boy. It's one thing to have confidence that things are going to turn out okay. It's another thing to assume I don't have any responsibility because God will fix it all for me. You can't be a parent and ignore the potential threats to your child in life or develop strategies to protect them. Angels showing up not only may have escalated violence in the region, it actually could have also turned Joseph and Mary into bad parents. Here's a point I'd like you to see. Some people think that the only option available for Christ followers is to stand your ground. That this is what Scripture kind of calls us to. When in doubt, just be brave. Stand your ground. See what God will do. But what about Moses, who had to be floated down a river in a basket, waterproofed by his mother, so that he could escape a very similar kind of death intent that was placed on baby boys in Egypt? Or what about Paul who had to be let down over the wall in a basket so that he could escape the persecution that was coming against him in Damascus? Or what about the early Christians in Jerusalem who had to flee for their lives because of the persecution that was against them and they spread the gospel as they went? You see, there are fleeing stories in scripture. We just tend not to pay very much attention to them. Sometimes God says, stay and see what I will do. Hold your peace, stand your ground, I will take care of you. Sometimes he says that, but sometimes God says, run, and I will tell you when it is safe to return. And I don't think we give those stories as much credence. I don't think we talk about them as much. See, the evidence of our faith is on our obedience to what God tells us, not our assumption of what God wants. So God sent this message to Joseph, get up, get out. Why was running away a wise option for Joseph and Mary? The first is God is the one who gave the command. Now here's the thing. It is a problem when we only respond to the commands that we want to hear. And it is built into the DNA of humanity to want to walk our own way. And the Western culture, particularly that of our country, we pride ourselves on rugged individualism and having just enough rebellion to let everybody know, I'm my own person. It's a problem when we only respond to the commands we want to hear. We need to understand this about the commands of God. You're not going to like all of them. But he doesn't give them because it's what our preference is. He gives them for our good. He's not trying to restrict life. He's trying to preserve life. That's why he gives us commands. So he gave a command, get up and get out. And God specified a direction. He actually said, go to Egypt. A command without direction can be very confusing. If he just said, get up and get out, there's a lot of unanswered questions there, and it's hard to figure it out. 
So how do you figure out situations like that? Well, you seek wise counsel and you keep your heart open and humble before God. And humility basically is a position that says two things about yourself. One is, I might be wrong. Let's just all practice that phrase together. Ready? On three. One, two, three. I might be wrong. Some of you couldn't say it, could you? But you could be. Humility says, I might be wrong. Here's another aspect of humility. I could do better. Let's all say that together. Ready? I could do better. If we're willing to do that, then God is able to give us direction in our life. But when we assume I'm doing it the right way, when we're afraid that if we find out maybe we're wrong or we could do it better, we'll just feel really bad and we want to avoid that bad feeling, that's a problem. And so we have to keep our heart open and humble before God. Direction is not always easy to hear, but it's essential if we're going to learn and if we're going to grow and if we're going to live. We often want God to fix a situation. We want him to remove the pain. Isn't that what most of our prayers are? Just take the pain away. And what God is saying, maybe I need to do something different in you than just remove pain. There's a third reason why that is a, it was wise for Joseph and Mary to run, and that is that God provided resources. The wise men had actually brought gifts. They had just left, and they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, which is kind of cool because these are portable universal currencies. No matter where they go, they could trade or sell these commodities in order to be able to find a place to live and to make a living. It's a really cool thing that God provided. But I have seen people refuse the provision of God simply because it made them uncomfortable. They didn't want to feel obligated to God or to another person. I myself don't find it easy to receive things from people. And uh, as much as I would like to tell myself it's just because I'm humble and I don't think I deserve it, the truth is, is that I think I'm proud and I don't think I need it. It's very easy to fall into that pit, to be able to open up our hearts to, to receive what God provides through others is a really remarkable thing to do. Now, I understand it made them feel uncomfortable. But I also understand this. God is not required to factor in our comfort or our preferences when he's working out a protection for our lives. Our comfort is not the most important thing to God. Who we are becoming and spending eternity with him, that's his priority. So this journey, as it turns out, this is not without risk. Joseph is taking his family out of the country. They're traveling in the middle of the night. They're going to be refugees in a foreign land. Uh, they're not going, it's not going to be easy to find a place to live. And travel in that section of the country, in that time in history, it's risky business, especially if you traveled in small numbers. So obedience to get up and get out was not an easy option to exercise. We read the Christmas story, and we just think that everybody just kind of Oh, well, it's time to go. <laughs> That's not what it was at all. It felt very dangerous. Sometimes the reasons for not getting out of a situation is because the person is running from the truth. Sometimes we don't get up and go. And we stay because we're running from the truth. The signs are all there. There's unity and the counsel of wise friends and advisors. There's opportunity there's provision, and it can be easy to refuse to accept the situation is really as bad as it is. And it can be easy to think things will change when there's absolutely no evidence that they will. And we can think that faith requires us to stand our ground in a dangerous situation. But are there other lives at risk? This is not a talk about disagreements and hurt feelings. There are conversations that can be destructive that we can find ourselves in. They're destructive and they're dehumanizing. It's not just a disagreement. It's far worse than that. The goal of the conversation isn't working through a hard conversation to find a solution or to reconcile two individuals. The words are actually being used to accuse and to wound. You should know. You can excuse yourself from that conversation. You don't have to stand there and take that. Get up and get out. You don't have to be mean about it, but you don't have to just allow someone to keep beating you down all the time. There are homes that are marked by violence. 
promises to love and to cherish, they've long been abandoned. Hands that were supposed to hold and express love are now used as weapons. Scripture does not require you to stay in an environment like that. Seek wise counsel. Find out what resources are available. You are not in control of that situation. You are being controlled in that situation. And God is not making that person abuse you. Why should you stay in an environment like that? And then there are work environments that are unsafe. We've seen numerous reports on national news of how people have used their power to sexually harass others. I've got some advice for you. Brush up your resume, fill out some applications, talk to some people who know how to find out what options exist. Get up and get out. God doesn't require you to stay in a situation like that. But we're afraid. We're afraid of the unknown. Please hear this. Fear of the unknown is not the same as direction from God. Because we don't know what could happen if we exercise this option. We sometimes think that God's not opening that door for us. God is not the author of fear. He is relentlessly committed to truth. So listen and look for truth. Listen to and look for truth. Now, the truth is not always easy to hear. Truth may make the situation seem even more difficult. Uh, there's some questions husbands should never answer, okay? <laughs> Does this make me look fat? <laughs> Don't go there. And by the way, not any fatter than usual is not a good response either. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> Leave it alone. Some truth is not easy to hear. And sometimes truth feels like it makes the situation worse. But please remember what Jesus says. It is only the truth that can make us free. That's what Christ is after. So how can God let these things happen? Why is there violence and abuse and sexual harassment and, and all these things that occur in our world today? And by the way, this is not limited to our culture. This has been throughout time and in every culture that there is. There's never been a utopia where this didn't occur. Well, what I would say is every single one of us prize our freedom. We don't want someone controlling us and telling us what we can and can't do or should and shouldn't do. God has actually created us with the power to choose. That's a real power. It's an incredible power. It might be the greatest power that anyone has ever been given. You get to choose. And sometimes we make choices that lead to life. And sometimes we make choices that lead to death. Sometimes we make choices that are healthy. Sometimes we make choices that are destructive. Sometimes we make choices that are honorable. Sometimes we make choices that are dishonorable. We want the right to choose, but we also want God to preempt the right of someone else to choose if it's going to negatively impact us. Here's what you need to know. God gives us the right to choose, and those choices have real consequences, and sometimes those consequences bring so much pain into our world, it's unthinkable. And we wonder, how can God allow something like this? And all I can tell you is this. The Herods of this world are going to stand before God. And they will be judged. Their day will come. I know, I wish it did never have to happen in our world, but that's not how the world actually works. So, you're sitting here going, wow. Now I'm supposed to go home and have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> so you are probably in a loving home, and you have a lot to look forward to and enjoy over the next 24 hours. Um, you're not in a dangerous situation. You're actually looking forward to the people you're going to see and the time you're going to spend. But that might be, not be true of everyone you come in contact with this Christmas. So please, if they dare to share their story with you, do not assume that faith requires them 
to stay in a destructive situation. Sometimes it takes faith to accept the truth, to get up and get out of that situation. Joseph and Mary and Jesus would all return. They did not live the rest of their lives in Egypt. God told them he would let them know when it was safe to come back again. Your decision to get out of a dangerous situation is not necessarily a permanent one, but it's often a necessary one. And the same God who prompted you to get up and get out can let you know when it's safe to return. So that's the part of the Christmas story that we don't talk very much about. And in case you're wondering, tonight's talk will be a lot easier <laughs> and a lot shorter. Let's bow our heads. Um, if, if you've been in this situation or you know someone who has... You know what it does to your emotions? It just tears them up. And I think sometimes we believe that God has seen it so many times that he's grown a little bit callous to it. That when he sees a life being torn down and fractured at the deepest levels of their soul, sometimes he just goes, oh well. But he never does. The numbness of our world is the evidence of our sin. The heart of God has never been touched by such sin. And the heart of God has always been sensitive to every painful experience that any of his children have ever had to endure. So what I would tell you today is that the heart of God breaks for these things. Tears roll down his face. And he looks for and longs for the day that nothing like this will ever happen again. And he went to work to make sure, and he works to this day. He sent his one and only son so that everything of the order of darkness and destruction could be overturned by light and by grace, and that there will come a day when all of this will be nothing more than a very distant memory. God is at work doing that today. This is the gift of his son to our world, and for this we are incredibly grateful. So Father, help us today. Give us wisdom. Speak truth to us. Help us find the courage to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.